Thank you very much, Georgina, and um, our chairman, Lee Clifford, and all my other distinguished former colleagues, and very distinguished guests. Um, it's a great pleasure to be giving the opening paper to this, what promises to be a wonderful conference. My paper, despite what Georgina said, is not strictly focused on the early years, but rather sets out to provide a framework within which we might consider Robert Menzies. We've heard from the Prime Minister um, and from Alan Tudge a number of comments, statements, propositions about Robert Menzies. And yet there is, I think, implicit in Alan Tudge's question, why has it taken so long, uh, an important issue for us. Why has it taken so long, 55 years uh, since Menzies retired as Prime Minister and we're just opening the Robert Menzies Institute today? My general thesis about why it's taken so long is that Australians find it very difficult to come to grips with a man of Menzies stature. That if someone is a giant, it's very difficult for others to say, well, what made this man tick? Um, what kind of man is Menzies? Um, who are we dealing with here? And I'm going to propose that there are dimensions of Menzies that are still under-investigated, under-explored in the historiography of the period. And um, hopefully um, may stimulate others to comment. In the depth of the Great Depression, in September 1931, Amid the crumbling ruins of the opposition Nationalist Party and the Scullin government, Robert Menzies, on behalf of the soon to be extinct Victorian National Federation, stated his belief in the need for a politics based on principle rather than pressure. And I'm going to quote him. I believe he said that a large majority of the public today is perfectly ready to give its adherence to a party which will display political principle and political courage. We have suffered far too much from people who have no political convictions beyond a more or less genteel adherence to our side of politics. That kind of adherence is worthless. We must have people who believe things and who are prepared to go out and struggle to make their beliefs universal. And this call for a politics of principle didn't come out of the blue. <clears throat> the younger Menzies was disgusted by the concessions made to the clamoring crowd of special interests surrounding the government of which he was a part, especially the most powerful of them. Menzies as a man of principle had already made himself known when he resigned in July 1929 as the newly elected member for East Yarra Province in the Victorian Legislative Council over the terms of a deal between the state nationalist government and the Progressive Country Party, which gave, he believed, excessive benefits to the country interests. Having entered the Commonwealth Parliament as member for Kuyong in 1934, he resigned again on principle in March 1939, when Cabinet refused to support the compulsory national insurance scheme to which he was deeply committed. He resigned indeed a third time in August 1941 on his own initiative as Prime Minister, while remaining leader of the majority party in the Parliament, something that I think has never happened before or since in what he judged were the interests of unity in his own party. There's no doubt that ideas and principles were important to Menzies. He would doubtless have agreed with the now famous comment of the English economist John Maynard Keynes 
in the conclusion of his general theory that, quote, the ideas of economists and philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, said Keynes, looking to his own future, the world is ruled by little else. Menzies would later write, the art of politics is to convey ideas to others. If possible, to persuade a majority to agree, to create or encourage a public opinion so soundly based that it endures and is not blown aside by chance winds to persuade people to take long range views. He told the founding conference of his Liberal Party in 1944 that it was a matter, and I quote, desperate importance to the future of our country that liberal thought be revived in Australia. And the resolution establishing the Liberal Party, moved by Menzies himself, described the party as, and I quote, a federal body representing liberal thought. He would later describe the creation he led as a party with a philosophy, a party very different to the Nationalist Party through which he had entered politics and the United Australia Party, which he had led, each of which he saw as guided in their policies too much by powerful selfish interests, a criticism he also levied at the Labor Party. In 1954, early in his second period as Prime Minister, an older and presumably even wiser Menzies told an audience of businessmen in Melbourne that while policy expediency was sometimes necessary, he held firm to the importance of principle wisely applied. And I'm quoting him again, if I may say so, gentlemen, our great danger in Australia, and we are nearer to it at this moment than perhaps ever we were before, is that we should abandon political principle in favour of a series of purely ad cap tandem arguments. That's worth votes. That ought to bring someone in. Look, of all the menaces in the political world, that is the worst. He appealed to the businessmen present to accept that his government was closer to their own philosophic position than any other, and that in practical affairs, it was better to mix a great deal of principle and occasionally a little expediency than it was to pursue impractical principle and a million times better than principled expediency. The question I'd now like to pose is where is this Menzies in the historiography of his political journey? If politics is a battle of ideas, and if the world is ruled by little else, and if we concede that ideas are usually unusually important to Menzies as a politician, is it not appropriate to ask what were the ideas that drove Menzies policies and politics? And in the context of the formation of this institute, what is the relevance of his ideas today? The appraisal of Robert Menzies has been a very extended project. The contributors to which have included politicians, public servants, academics, journalists, former colleagues, family, and many beyond Australia. I must confess that understanding and assessing Menzies indeed has been a long-standing interest of mine stretching as far back as my later childhood, being a consistent topic around our family dinner table. My father knew Robert Menzies from the time of the formation of the Liberal Party, and Menzies, the leader and policymaker, was never far from his mind in not uncritical family discussions of Menzies' leadership, character, and policies. It's fair to say that much of the commentary and even the historiography of Menzies over the years has given remarkably little weight to assessing the content of Menzies' ideas. The coherence between the ideas, how he deployed them in his political life, and most importantly, assessing their significance for national policy and political culture in his time and ours. In the long saga, of assessing and reassessing Menzies that was to unfold in the decades after his retirement, the content of ideas was a fact that struggled to achieve any attention at all, nor any great weight, even by those sympathetic to and even admiring him. The assessment of Menzies has certainly come a long way since Earl Page's bitter attack on him 
1939 for not enlisting in the Great War, or any wards and indeed Labor's charge over the fictitious Brisbane line, or the passionately left-wing Manning Clark's assessment that Menzies served alien gods. Indeed, Clark wrote of Menzies, his passions for good food, good wine, the approval of the high and mighty, and the honours the British conferred on their gifted loyal subjects in Australia, that his judgment was warped and his conscience stifled. Follow the path of reason and conscience meant shedding all the pleasure that was the stuff of life to him. Needless to say, Clark's fantasy demolition of Menzies as a sybarite without judgment, conscience and reason has not stood the test of time. But as Menzies defended his record in his seriously underestimated memoirs Afternoon Light and the Measure of the Years, his partisan critics condemned it and his ministerial colleagues eager to move on did little to defend it. Donald Horne in The Lucky Country thought that Menzies achieved nothing and the interest of Menzies' colleagues in promoting change and reform in an era when these pressures grew intense led to the idea that his period of government had only been peaceful, but one of stagnation. Although attacks on Menzies serving partisan purposes still continue, um, such as those from former Prime Minister Paul Keating, the turning point was ushered in, in a way by Alan Martin's two volumes, published in 1993 and 1999. Martin's political sympathies were with Labor, but it became his professional mission to use historian John Hurst's words in later introducing a book of Martin's papers to simply get the history right. As a student of Martin's, I can vouch for Alan's passion in his post-Clark task of buttressing intellectual integrity in the task of understanding Australia's political history and Menzies' place in it. Martin noted that Menzies has long been caricatured for their own purposes by politicians as well as television, radio and print journalists. Martin rebutted many of the partisan and ideological criticisms of Menzies, attempting fair judgments on Menzies' handling of policy issues, including the Cold War, nuclear and Aboriginal policies, while emphasising in words still present in many assessments that Menzies in his attitudes was a man of his time with perhaps the implication that we shouldn't pay too much attention to his ideas today. Martin's Menzies is a highly influential and skilled actor, but Menzies' ideas and ideals do not figure much in Martin's account. Menzies the politician, Menzies the man, have received impressive attention in books by Gerard Henderson, John Howard and Troy Bramston. John Howard concluded that Menzies' greatest legacy as a statesman was to lay the foundations of modern Australia. Troy Bramston, who I see here in the front row, welcome Troy, concluded that Menzies' most contemporary relevant legacy was to establish a model for effective leadership that provided stability and unity with clear policy direction and philosophical conviction that resulted in continuing electoral success and longevity in government. What of Menzies' actual values and beliefs and are they relevant today? Menzies didn't hide these. Menzies assessed, Menzies, uh, Martin assessed Menzies' 1942 Forgotten People speech based only on the single talk of that name, characterising it as a powerful piece of political propaganda. But it did not stand alone that speech being one of 37 such talks that Menzies brought together in a book published the following year, 1943, under the title, The Forgotten People and Other Studies in Democracy, a book Menzies himself described as a summarized political philosophy. We should note that such a book is rare in Australian political life. With the exception of Billy Hughes's The Case for Labor, None of Menzies' Labor contemporaries attempted to put their ideas into such a substantial and coherent form. Not Curtin, not Chifley, not Evatt as a party leader, nor Corwell. The neglect and re-emergence of the Forgotten People book is in some respects the story of the re-engagement of appraisals of Menzies as a national leader with his ideas treated 
as political influences or variables, rather than as windows into his character. Menzies believed, indeed, that the ideas he set out were of lasting, timeless quality. Indeed, he self-consciously attempted to apply to Australian politics. In his economic and social policies, central ideas that had long been part of the long tradition of liberal thought that had come to Australia at the time of the, what now known as the Enlightenment. So far as I'm aware, from its publication in 1943, Menzies' book was not republished for almost 70 years. Until in 2011, the Victorian Liberal Party, of which I was then president, republished it in a handsome coffee style edition. It's since been republished again, in fact, simile of the original edition by the Menzies Research Centre. With the emphasis of liberal thought on the supremacy of the individual and its spirit that a creative, moral and harmonious society can grow out of the actions of free people living under just laws, Menzies advocated liberalism as a philosophical alternative to those who emphasised a government of special or special interest directed at directed society. To those who emphasised a government or special interest directed society and a politics based on identities of class, religion and race. The universal values and respect for equal human dignity embraced by liberal thought were, he made clear, the basis for a progressive society. In the difficult politics of the time in which we live, of national security, climate change, radical identity politics, and the coronavirus pandemic, Robert Menzies' ideas are looked to by many in hope of guidance on policy. Menzies' Forgotten People talks and later expositions of his election speeches and elsewhere invite us to test Menzies' principles as they are applied to his policies for an economy based on private enterprise and choice in health and education, to freedom of speech and association, to the role of women in society and politics, and to Aboriginal Australia. I've attempted a preliminary assessment in my book on liberalism in Australia between 1925 and Menzies' retirement, certainly what I've written is not the last word on these important matters. There have been recent illuminating contributions to the appraisal of Menzies' cultural context and spiritual beliefs by Stephen Shavura, Greg Malewis and David First Roberts. And in his 2017 Menzies oration, this university's current chancellor, Alan Miles, explored Menzies' understanding of the role of university education in society. And of course, we now have letters Menzies sent to his daughter Heather, which she has since published and which support the view of her father as a politician to whom not only politics, but ideas mattered deeply. Menzies' actions and his principles marked out a path to continuing reform and his successors have approached the task with enthusiasm. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was fantastic and impeccably timed too. I didn't have to get my shepherd's crook out. <laughs> I lost a paragraph. Oh, well, can be in the um, written version later down the track. <laughs> um, David, I wanted to start off the Q&A um, asking you why you think historians like Manning Clark and Donald Horn were so quick to stereotype Menzies. Um, you, you elucidated a bit, but can you can you unpack that a bit more? The heart of politics is to stereotype one's opponents, um, and uh, parties do it all the time. Um, and of course, Menzies, being the figure that he was, invited demolition by his political opponents. It was important to those who disagreed with Menzies, who advocated other interests or other philosophies to tear Menzies down. And um, I think that's what Alan Martin was really saying when he said he wanted to be objective in assessing Menzies. Coming from that background, he could see what had happened. He didn't believe one party in Australia had all the truth. 
And so he set out to provide a very factual and he thought balanced account of uh, Menzies' life and political career. Hi, uh, that was great. But I'd like to add that from um, being a person from your generation, I think one of the problems with what happened when Menzies left politics was that he got done like a dinner by Labor historians and the sort of thing you're doing now took 50 years to happen. Would you like to comment on the fact that the other side of politics let the side down with not enough intellectual fight back? Well, I think that um, Martin really pulled Menzies away from that kind of debate and discussion and gave us a Menzies that we could talk about and, and with information and uh, knowledge about what Menzies was aiming to do and what he did in fact do um, and provide assessments. My reservation, as you, you may have gathered, about Martin's wonderful book is that Martin's book tells you very little about what ideas motivated Menzies and how he sought to use those ideas in politics. Um, and and I, I think that we're still at a stage where we're doing that, we're trying to do that, because ideas are in fact very difficult to deal with as variables, unless you dig into them and discuss their um, direction that's implicit in them and their internal contradictions and how they affect the organisation of politics, um, one inevitably is drawn to what is a more um, tabloid version of history, which is what did he do then? What was that event like? What did, he, what did his opponents say about that? Was that controversial or not? And, and, and we get that kind of um, what I would regard as somewhat shallow version. I mean, either one believes that ideas are important in politics or one doesn't. Um, I, I believe and have believed throughout my entire political career that they were and that it was important that policies and ideas be related and that those ideas in fact find some sort of organisational representation. Not everyone approaches politics with that in mind, but uh, so it depends I think ultimately on one's judgement of how ideas and politics intersect um, and uh, if you believe that then you need to look at Menzies closely at that level of analysis. Thank you, David, and thank you for um, you know articulating uh, this robust political philosophy for us. I think it it strikes me that it's quite rare amongst prime ministers in our history to to see that being done. And what I'm interested to know is how much do you put it down to Menzies' sheer force of will to create and advocate that political philosophy, or was it that the conditions of the time were right to receive it? And if, and if you think it's the latter, what do you think are the important characteristics of a society to be ready to receive a kind of new, robust political philosophy? I think it took a lot of courage on the part of Robert Menzies during the 1930s and 40s to advocate those ideas. They were not the conventional wisdom. Uh, the um, idea that capitalism was finished, the Great Depression and the war had finished it off, that the future was going to be one where government essentially controlled and regulated society. Um, and in the case of Australia, where certain interests would be powerful and certain interests would not be powerful, um, I think there was almost an acceptance that that was where we were going. But having said that, a concept that I, I find very useful is the concept of the liberal project. And the liberal project is not just a set of ideas, it's a, a set of institutions built on those ideas that last, and professions that advocate those ideas. And Menzies was one part of one of those professions, the law. And this is why he put Parliament as his principal institution in the society. So he wasn't talking without a base, but that base was being obscured by two decades, perhaps longer, one might say, of politics. And so I think it was not that the times were favourable, the times were unfavourable, but he, he knew that given the 
fundamentally enlightenment character of Australian political culture, there was something there that he could evoke, and he did evoke it. Well, David, I might like, I wanted to um, bring you to 2021 and ask you, um, do you think ideas, I mean, ideas matter always, but in our political debates, intellectual debates now, are, the, are ideas as present as they were when Menzies was Prime Minister? Menzies thought that one of his great achievements was the establishment of a party with a philosophy. Now, the great danger that all political parties face is that they become career ladders. Actually having a philosophy and knowing what the ideas are and how they relate to each other is actually quite a difficult exercise. And there's no question in my mind that politically in Australia for that sort of Menzies ideal, if you like, of a party which governed in the public interest based on ideas and not according to the interests and pressures of the powerful requires a number of individuals, certainly you know, the leaders of politics, Australian politics, to be prepared to articulate the ideas that make Australia such a unique political system. And I mean, one can judge in our own state and nationally who is articulating those ideas, how well they're articulating and whether they're succeeding or not in mobilising the response, which I believe still lies very strongly in the fundamentally liberal character of the institutions and professions that Australia has. Um, I, I wanted to pick up on um, uh, Menzies' use of the media when it came to um, you know, expounding his ideas. He, he was a great orator, wasn't he? And he um, would love a town hall meeting. He loved a heckler, actually. He would have, he would have enjoyed protesters, I think. Um, but um, these days we have um, a 24-7 media, um, it, it, you know, social media, things, obviously, none of those things were around in Menzies' day. Do you think that makes it harder to, to, to fight the battle of ideas, to, to um, exercise the art of persuasion when it comes to ideas when you're in a 24-7 media cycle? Josina, my short answer to that is no. Uh, it's, um, ideas, in fact, are, are still immensely powerful. And uh, the media is full of ideas. Um, and um, social media is putting ideas, some of them are bad ideas. There's a lot of prejudice, as we know, in Twitter. Uh, there's, a, there's a tendency for crowds and mobs to form electronically. But the idea that somehow or other politics is really just a response to the money in the hands of the most powerful interests is, I think, wrong. Um, it's not that money is not valuable. <laughs> it's not that parties don't go out of their way to collect it and, and use taxpayers' money if they can to do it. But what's going to win them election in the end are ideas. And it's ideas that matter to people because without ideas, you can't find motivation. You don't find satisfaction. You can't build an organization. You can't decide what direction to go in. I mean, all these fundamentally important aspects of political and human behavior depend on ideas. And it doesn't matter whether it's the electronic world or the music world. Well, that's a fantastic note to end on. Thank you so much, David.